Hello sports fans, this is Freak bringing you an audio commentary for WCReplays.com. It's been a little while for me, so I'm coming back and doing one. Uh, this audio is on a game that I, in the time of recording, played literally like 30 seconds ago. I was like, hey, that was a decent game, let's do an audio on it. Um, I can't guarantee my opponent is the best player ever, but his record is pretty decent. Uh, he's an orc player, as you can tell from loading up the replay, and according to Battle.net, his ELL was higher than mine. Uh, I'll give you two guesses which player I am. Probably shouldn't be too hard, but uh, just to break the ice for you, I am David Freak Turley. Um, shout out to my opponent. I would assume you're watching this by the fact that you recognize who I am and stuff like that. Um, nothing too special going on. Let's go ahead and pause this at the 30 second mark from my point of view. Fog of War on. I'm really just going to talk about my mindset and my process to playing this game here. Because I think that's really one of the best ways to play this game is to sort of or sorry, to teach this game, is to really tell you what I'm thinking of. Um, a couple things I'm going to try to work on for this audio is I will try to talk a little bit slower as I realize most people in the world are not native English speakers. Uh, additionally, I'm going to try to spell out all my actions the best I can. So, Fog of War on, my point of view, the Night Elf player, quite obviously, and I realize I played random, but he's orc, it doesn't matter what he does, he's going to do the same thing no matter what. Um, anyway, so 30 second mark, we're paused. I'm going to take some time to describe the opening setup while we wait either for you guys to get there or just to talk. So the first thing we notice is the altar and the moonwell placement are against the trees. Uh, right now, all this does is it really only currently blocks off two wisps, the one that's between the altar and the moonwell, and the one directly below, or sorry, up and to the right of the moonwell. Uh, in hindsight, this isn't really the best base build ever. I don't even block off all that many wisps, and you'll sort of see some kind of dumb play in my base later on, but ultimately, I'm just sort of trying to do the general rule of thumb of build stuff against the trees, make a line, your trees will be somewhat blocked off. In the end, I end up being able to block off, I think, maybe like six trees, which isn't a ton, but it's at least something. Um, a couple things to point out with this game is my resource management. You will, I will try to point that out to you as best I can, and this really ties into the build order. Uh, my unit production and choices, and just a lot of general things that you're going to see this game. So, uh, this is really just the opening. There's nothing too much to say about this build order so far, so let's go ahead and unpause this game from the 30 second mark, my point of view. Unpause in 3, 2, 1, go. So 31, 32, 33. Okay, so just some mindless pregame chatter, nothing special going on. What I am going to do this game is, of course, building the altar and moon well. I'm going to do some standard production. But additionally, I'm going to be scouting with both the wisp coming off my altar and the wisp coming off of my moon well. Now that does delay my building production somewhat because my wisps are scouting as opposed to chopping lumber. However, um, <clears throat> as I try to do in this build order anyway, is that I will get to 20 food of wisps before I tech. Now I actually make a mistake in not building a moon well before I tech, which was honestly just a mistake. I had forgotten to actually make a moon well. And normally I would. However, it ended up working out quite well with this build order, so maybe in the future I won't uh, build a second moon or right away. But the point is, even though I'm losing lumber on these on these wisps scouting and whatnot, as it turns out, I don't actually need that lumber because uh, I'm going to be waiting for my twentieth twentieth wisp to tech, which is going to take more time than uh, it takes for these wisps to harvest lumber. Uh, and additionally. I'm not going to be producing my first Huntress until after that, and so even though my Ancient of War Hunters Hall will be more or less late because of that, they're going to sit there idle for a bit before I actually produce units. So uh, it's really not that big a deal, as we're going to find out. So there's the build order. At around 150 lumber, at around, at around actually 140 lumber, I start looking at my base for which Wisp is going to return lumber, and as soon as one of these Wisps gets a plus 5, I pull him off and I tell him to go make an Ancient of War. By the time that Wisp reaches that location, I just go back to the top, I look at whichever Wisp returned for 160, and just build a Hunter's Hall there. That's a little bit of, of quick. It, it requires a decent APM. You have to be able to, to build it and then go back to your base and do that. So for people with you know double-digit APM or whatever, you might want to build it a little bit sooner or whatnot. The main thing is you really want to get these buildings up and started as quickly as possible because you don't want to end up getting rushed or something and have your production be really slow. That's really the primary thing is you want to make sure that you're okay. Now what I did here is I scouted two directions and as soon as I found out where my opponent was I set my other wisp to go chill by some trees. 
Now notice here towards the bottom left of the map, I've sent a wisp over to build an expansion. And that's going to be very crucial for me later in the game. But you'll see that I've started Technic Tier 2, and uh, notice that my Ancient War Hunters all finally come up, and I'm like, oh crap, I forgot a Moonwell. So I go and make one here. But this is the really important thing here. My opponent actually makes a mistake, I believe. But what I do is I hit, a, I hit a Peon once, and then entangle it. And that's very important. Typically, a Peon can just barely survive, entangle, then attack. It sort of ends up happening that way somehow just from my experience at least, uh, or if you get bad damage rolls or whatnot, sometimes the peon will live if you entangle and then attack, then the peon will live and you will get nothing out of it. It'll be an injured peon, who cares? So I make sure I wait for a, a peon to start returning gold, A click, and my hotkey is Z, Z click, and I start fighting it. My moonwell is close to done now, and I'm just going to produce a single huntress and have that go on its way. Nothing too special going on, mostly I've just picked off three peons from his gold mine. Now he's of course going to switch peons off of lumber onto gold, but now that means, look, he's got one, two, three, four on wood. That's very, very poor production from him. Now, uh, we play who has better ping, and he wins, he gets the boots of speed. I had run up to the shop, pressed hold position, and simply spammed Q and left click and couldn't get the boots of speed, so instead I run to the closest shop I can find, which is down here, and I again run up to the shop, shift click hold position, click the shop, grab the boots and start running away. And as soon as I clicked for the boots, I started running away. I know that with ping, the boots will show up in my inventory and I, just can, I can just get out of the way as soon as possible. And that ends up working out very well for me. Additionally, I had this Tree of Life started. The Tree of Life, I believe, was started before my first Huntress as well. This was simply a product of me having a... Uh, a late Moonwell again, but as it turns out in hindsight, this might actually be a very, very good build order. Now, you do realize that, of course, I have one unit now, four and a half minutes into the game. I clearly have no production, and I'm relying entirely on my Keeper of the Grove. Uh, also, for those of you old school listeners and players and viewers, whatever, you will recall that this is very similar to the strategy I used to use uh, back when I actually played this game and was good at it. Uh, with the Keeper of the Grove Huntress opener. However, back then I did like the sort of mass Huntress Archer thing. This is more of a standard play style where you end up expoing and going into mass strides and whatnot, and you'll sort of see how that plays out instead. This is just a random uh, point that this is sort of an old school strategy that I, I think someone else had invented and I sort of ripped from, but uh, gave it my own spin. So all I've done right here is I uh, was going, to, I was intending on harassing and because my Keeper of the Grove was running across the map, but I started checking on all my production, and, what, and I was like, my Tree of Life is almost done. Um, let's go and expand instead. I've just forced him, and actually very uh, honestly, a lot of why I even ran over there is my Huntress harassing his Blade Master staff to his shop. As you saw the little blue orb thingy above his, above his shop, we knew that he was coming home to defend because he thought I was going to go for round two on the Keeper of the Grove harass. And, I mean, rightly so, that was actually my intention. However, as it turns out, I realized, okay, well, he's stuck in his base. He hasn't seen any of my other units yet. Uh, he's probably not going to chase his Huntress. And actually, I was being a little bit uh, cautious, like, is he, um, is he actually going to be chasing that Huntress? Is he windwalked and, like, I can't see him? Is he going to find this expansion? And it turns out he never does, which is good for me. Uh, now, you see right here, I, I pull the creeps, and I entangle the Forest Troll Berserker. And you notice that I go for this one Berserker first. I do end up taking a lot of damage on my Keeper, which is a little bit dangerous. Uh, but primarily, I'm just trying to get rid of these Berserkers first, because they take the most damage and do the most damage. And then I'm letting just the, the Rock Golem get tanked, and, and I'm not really worried about it. Uh, anyway, I go to expand. The Beastmaster was just a choice of, you know, I'm not sure it seems like the right choice. Uh, I was planning on pressuring, and I didn't have many units, so, you know, summon seemed like a good idea. Uh, meanwhile, back in my base is Blademasters, of course, wreaking havoc. And honestly, he should think something's up. He should think that I'm creeping something big, which I am. Uh, and or expanding, which I am, uh, because generally players will not allow a blade master to run around through their base and do nothing. He knows I have boots of speed, he knows I have a keeper, he knows I more or less have the means of chasing him out of my base, and he's not sort of thinking about, well, why isn't he doing anything? You know, why, why is he on his own? That's not the right term for it. Why isn't he chasing me away, more or less, is, is really what I'm looking for. So the Beastmaster finally shows up, and thankfully, this Beastmaster, and this was this was actually partially my intention, I didn't want to show him the item on my Keeper of the Grove. Good players will know what items drop from what camps. Potion of Greater Healing only drops from the main bases. This, for example, this bottom left thing right here 
that's the only place a potion of greater healing will drop from. So I didn't actually want to show my keeper. And actually, as I started running to my base, I considered just chugging the healing potion and sucking it up with, you know, wasting a big healing potion, but because I didn't want him to know that was there, and he, he wouldn't have seen me take any damage, all he saw was a level 2 hero, and that's very easy to get from any number of camps. He would have had no information from that uh, piece of information. No information from that piece of information? Yeah, whatever. Point is, 